Bathsheba and the King, Part 1. David was blessed. As a young man, he killed Goliath, the Philistine giant whom King Saul and the Israelite soldiers feared to the point of running into hiding any time he appeared. Saul was so impressed with David's courage, bravery, and the fact that he killed Goliath that he kept David in his service and would not let him go back to his own family. Saul was not the only one who was impressed by David's performance. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 5-7 to seven. Whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. God chose David to be king over Israel. He carried the anointing of God on his life. He was the father of many children, a powerful warrior, a very wealthy man, a highly successful king, and so on. He enjoyed abundant blessings from God with promises of much more to come. David definitely lived a, a life that was enviable. Now, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, we are told of how King David saw Bathsheba, the very beautiful wife of Uriah the Hittite, taking a bath in her house. He sent for her, slept with her, and got her pregnant. He tried to use her husband, Uriah, to cover his sin. When that did not work, he arranged for Uriah to be killed and eventually married Bathsheba. Have you ever wondered why Bathsheba gave in to the king, even though she was a married woman and was supposed to respect her husband and marital vows? Why did she not refuse to commit adultery with David? Could it be that she was afraid of David, afraid of saying no to him and getting killed? After all, David was a very powerful king and therefore could kill anyone he wanted to kill. Now, we live at a time when a lot of leaders have a conscience that has been seared with a hot iron. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Even among the leaders in the household of God, pastors, elders, unit leaders, and so on, there are many who water down the seriousness of sin or even make their followers believe that certain things which are condemned in the scriptures are not sinful after all. Some of the pastors in this category encourage their church members to hate and have nothing to do with anyone that is not their member, even though the Bible says we should love and be at peace with everyone. Some condemn gossiping in their sermons but encourage it privately if it is to their benefit. They call it loyalty to spiritual authority. Some steal from their church and get their church fund handlers to cooperate with them and help them cover their tracks. There are even some who sleep with their church members and make them believe that God either authorized or approves of their shameful act, thereby dragging God's holy name in the mud. There are even cases of pastors who have succeeded in destroying the marriages of their parishioners. Sadly, a lot of the people who go into sin with or because of their church leaders are doing so out of fear. They are afraid of touching the servant of God because the Lord commanded in Psalm 105 verse 15 that no one should touch or harm his anointed ones and prophets. Some are afraid of being labeled rebellious so that they will grant the, so they will grant the leader's wish even when it is unscriptural. They then go back to God and ask for forgiveness. Yet others, not wanting their lives to be ruined, are afraid of being cursed by the anointed of the Lord. So they yield to the latter's unholy demands. If you have a pastor who is leading you to sin against God and you are following him, you need to cry to God for deliverance. According to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. Do not listen to anyone who tells you that if you do not follow his ungodly leading, you will be cursed. A curse cannot hurt you unless you deserve it, according to Proverbs chapter 26, verse 2. And refusing to sin against God definitely does not make you deserving of a curse. Some would even remind you that 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 says you should submit yourself to every ordinance of man. And if you fail to do so, God himself will punish you for your disobedience. Never forget, though, that wherever there is a conflict between God's word and man's ordinance, God expects you to choose his word. Church leaders are not the only kings that some Christians fear to the extent of sinning against God. There are also many Christians who sin against God because they are afraid of being oppressed and tortured by their bosses or getting fired from their jobs. Some others would rather disobey God than expose themselves to the anger of ungodly rulers. Meanwhile, 
In Luke chapter 12, verses 4 to 5, Jesus admonished us not to be afraid of people who can only kill the body. Instead, we are to fear God who has the power to not only kill, but also throw into hell. We all need to get to that level at which the three Hebrew boys operated. Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. Amen.